Well, yes, um, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, my whole speech about introducing myself is now null and void because you did such a good job, Dana. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh -uh. Um, but again, I'm Jory Sirota, and I'm the founder of Applied Yoga, and Dana, I think, mentioned my website. It's AppliedYogaIntegration.com, um, and whether it is Saturday morning for you guys, like it is for me here in New York, or I know we have people around the world, so it could be Saturday afternoon or Saturday evening. Um, my hope is that in this short time that we have with each other, uh, the effects of the teachings that I'm going to pass down to you can go further than just what you experienced today. As a teacher who's traveled the world for 10 years teaching both uh, neurokinetic therapy and applied yoga in different yoga courses, uh, my opportunities to spend ample time with people um, are few and far between. I get to have a weekend with somebody or a day or possibly a week or something like that. And it got instilled in me at a very early age that having such a short period of time, you have not a tremendous opportunity to have an effect on those people that has a longer lasting impact on them. This started back for me when I was becoming an orthopedic body worker back in around 2001, 2002. And the moment that I was about to work on my mentor for the first time ever, he stood in front of me and he was already an incredibly intimidating human being. And he said, if you cannot make a change in my body or any of your client's body in the first 20 to 30 minutes, they need to find a new therapist. And like my heart started beating and I, you know, had visions of running out of the room and never coming back. And it challenged me to understand that as a profession, for any of us, we need to be the absolute best that we can be and deliver the most important information. And I know that there's people on here today that are yoga students, but I know there's people here today that are yoga teachers. I know there's people today that are body workers and, and from other modalities. And taking the depth of what your understanding is and being able to pass that on to uh, your clients and your students is really of the utmost importance. Um, so today, we're going to talk about uh, versatility and asana uh, and, and discuss and practice the differences between alignment and variability. Um, variability in itself is kind of that ability to go back and forth and move this way and that way while still having control of your body and developing strength in those different ranges. But before I go into that a little bit more, I want to tell you guys where I'm coming from. And, and I won't talk for that long. I promise this is probably going to be about six or seven more minutes before I talk. And, and then we're going to get a good 30 minute practice in or so. But I began practicing yoga in 1997. Uh, I was 17 year old kid in college and took my first class and I completely fell head over heels in love. You know, I left that class. I felt like I was floating in space. I didn't have any anger anymore. I didn't have any fear anymore. I felt like I could interact with people and my body felt phenomenal. And so I had that thought, well, if an hour and a half class has this level of impact on me, I wonder what a life of this is going to create. So I woke up the next morning, you know, 6 a.m. in the morning, and I started practicing sun salutations in my room you know, or at least what I could remember of the sun salutations that I was taught. And I just dove in. And I found myself in India in 2000. And in 2002 is when I discovered Iyengar yoga. Now, coming from an orthopedic background, the alignment principles of Iyengar yoga spoke to me incredibly well. I liked the biomechanics of it. I liked the injury prevention of it. I like the injury rehabilitation potentials of it. Uh, and so I wound up practicing Iyengar yoga for around 14 years, very, very, very religiously. But I had two moments in my Iyengar yoga career that had very profound impacts on me. And one of those was in 2012 when I started having a left hip issue. And I was 
using all of the teachings from Iyengar yoga to work with a hip issue. And nothing was really working. And I went to my teacher and I said, hey, you know, my hip hurts here. What should I do about it? He said, don't worry, I got you. You know, uh, this is two minutes before the class. And he winds up teaching an hour and a half class just for my hip. I mean, the brilliance of an ability to be able to shift game plan like that is astounding. But I left the class and my hip was no better. And I went home and I was like, okay, well, it's kind of annoying. And I woke up the next morning, this was a time in my life when I was practicing every single day. And I said, you know, I wonder what happens if I do the exact opposite of the direction that's being taught to me. And I did it and I was like, huh, that feels really good. But you know, I had all these thoughts inside. Well, that's not what the teaching is. You know, this doesn't look like it's in proper alignment, blah, 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 blah. You know, my mind just starts racing. But I finished my practice and I was like, I feel better. Okay. So I wound up doing that for three days, the exact opposite of what I was taught. And at the end of three days, I had no more hip pain. And I started to have these thoughts in my mind say, okay. There must be something more going on here. There's got to be a deeper understanding of the human body that I don't understand yet, that I have been getting taught, but something needs to shift a little bit. Flash forward about four years later, and I'm studying with my same teacher again, and it's a weekend seminar. And during these weekend seminars, he has somewhere around 100 people in the room. We get them for two and a half days, Friday night to, to Sunday afternoon, something like that. And at the end of these conferences, workshops that he teaches, he does a Q and A. You know, so many people have all these questions for him. What do I do about this? What do I do about that? Blah, 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 blah. And he's in the middle of answering one of these questions. And, and he says, you know, the doctors tell me I need two shoulder replacements. raised my hand immediately. And I was like, did you say shoulder replacements? And he's like, yep. You know, emphatically, confidently. And I thought to myself, oh my goodness, wait a second. You know, this is the top Iyengar yoga teacher in the world, pretty much. And he's telling us that he needs two shoulder replacements. Now, hold on. We already know that he needs two hip replacements but he has told us for years that this is a congenital thing. His parents had bad hips, his grandparents bad, got, had bad hips. It's been passed down to him. Okay, I never fully believe that, but I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. For those of you that don't know, in the United States alone, there's somewhere around 350,000 hip replacements that happen per year. It's a massive number based off of our movement patterns, the way that we sit at desks, the way that we sit at chairs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But shoulder replacements are few and far between. That is a way less number. So I thought to myself, I was like, okay, Jory, this is your moment. You can either continue to travel down this path with this human being that you have been, you know, devoted to for X amount of years, who is in tremendous amounts of pain, and I was having a little back pain, I talked to you about my hip pain, or you can take the information that's being processed to you right now, and you can try to find something that's more healthy and creates better longevity for your body. And that was it. And so where this comes into is that difference between alignment and variability. Now, my teacher had perfect alignment. He was 62 years old at the time or something like that. But he's got hip problems, he's got shoulder problems, he's got back problems. Now, there's nothing wrong with alignment per se. Alignment is a beautiful thing. And if you read the definition or description of this workshop today, you saw that we are going to bust some myths of alignment while still honoring it. I love alignment having your joints in the right place, being able to sit with a good posture, 
all of these things are super important. The problem is, is if you are trying to only fit yourself into alignment and not anything else. See, there's nothing wrong with alignment and there's actually nothing wrong with misalignment. It's when you're stuck in misalignment or you're stuck in alignment that the problem occurs because of the lack of variability. Now, variability is really best described by something in anatomy and physiology called Davis's law. Now, you can Google Davis's law, you can look it up, et cetera, et cetera. But Davis's law, which has been around since I think 1856 or something like that, states that the human body heals, repairs, and strengthens in the ranges of motion that we challenge it. And when I say challenge, I also mean load. And by load, I mean putting some kind of weight, some kind of force distribution onto the joints or onto the range of motion. So if you are constantly trying to fit yourself into this, but your system has ability to go here and here, and all you're doing is kind of avoiding that because you've been told that this is right, you are missing an incredibly large aspect of the human experience. As we go through our days, as we walk, as we sit on the couch, as we're at the car, as we're hovering over the, the stove cooking dinner, as we're you know, chopping the vegetables, whatever it is, our bodies are versatile. Our bodies are always moving. And so for me, it just makes so much more sense to be able to strengthen and be able to move in all these different places with fluidity and with, I don't know, awareness, consciousness, strength, than it is to fit yourself into one tiny little box because of the large gamut that life presents to us. So, um, so it's with that that I will start our practice here. Um, and we are going to explore some different uh, aspects of alignment and variability. Okay, so I'm gonna back up. Uh, I don't need this cushion. And I think you guys can still see me pretty fine. We're good, right? Yeah. So after listening to everything for the last 17, 18 minutes or so, we're not gonna dive in too quick here. Let's just kind of warm the bodies up. So I want you guys to just simply take a child's pose, whether your knees are apart or whether your knees are together, I'm perfectly fine with that. And I'm just gonna have you come down, put your head on the ground and just kind of rest and begin to breathe. Now I know the audio is a little bit different with my head so close to the microphone. So I'm just gonna lift my head a little bit, but you guys can keep your heads down. and just keep going ahead and breathing. Allow yourselves to settle. Allow yourselves to just kind of come into your bodies a little bit here. There's really no need to do anything except just listen to how you're feeling. We have such a tendency to put pressure on ourselves or to uh, try to do something perfect in, in such a quick way that we miss this aspect of actually listening to what our specific needs are in the moment. So take another breath or two. Again, exactly. Take the pose that is right for you, whether your arms are straight, whether they're behind you, whether you're propping your head on your forearms, all of that is perfectly fine for me. Good, now just sit up for a second. You can sit on your heels, you can sit on your, on however you want to. Take your arms out to the sides like so. Now I'm gonna have you make fists because this gets a little bit easier when you make fists. I want everybody to turn your arms in all the way and then turn them out all the way. When you turn them in, we call this internal rotation makes sense. When you turn them out, we call it external rotation. So go back and forth. And I want you to get a sense of how 
it feels inside of your shoulder joints. Now you should be moving from the shoulder joint, not from the elbow or from the wrist. So when you take this action, put your mind, place your mind inside of the shoulder joint to feel what happens between the right and the left. And for many of us, you're gonna feel a big difference between the right and the left. Okay, so I, 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 I'm, I'm just doing this right now so you can feel that internal and external rotation of the shoulder, that one might have way more internal rotation than the other, and the other is gonna have more external rotation than the other. Okay, you guys got that, yes? Make sense? Awesome, now, everybody, take child's pose again, and this time, straighten your arms all the way. So you're gonna come down, child's pose, And I want you to actually lock your elbows. You don't have to completely lock them like a, a steel rod, but make your elbows straight. Now, one of the directions, and, and you guys forgive me, I'm, I, I'm gonna come out of the pose a lot so I can teach and I can look at the, uh, the uh, video here. One of the directions that, that we would give in Iyengar yoga quite often, which is a phenomenal direction, is you have an inner and outer part of your shoulder. The inner part of your shoulder is the part that's closest to your ear. The outer part is the part that's closest to away or furthest away from you. Take the inner part of your shoulder upwards and the outer part of your shoulder downwards. Now it's a really nice direction because when you do that, you're getting that bit of external rotation inside of your shoulder joints. And you're gonna feel the difference of what that does to your upper back and your neck. But you and I are gonna to play today. So what I want from you guys is to take your arms and go both directions. Your palms are flat on the ground, but you're gonna go external rotation of your shoulders and internal rotation of your shoulders. And again, I really just want you to feel what's taking place inside of your shoulder joint. When you take your shoulders in, you might feel like your upper trapezius, those upper traps get a little tight. That's okay, don't make them too tight, but just keep going back and forth and feeling that internal and external rotation of your shoulders. Yeah, and I, Dana, I really like that. You can do one at a time and you can get a sense of the difference between what's happening in your left and what's happening with your right, or just putting more attention on one than the other. Good, now you can come back to resting. And go ahead and push yourself into down dog. These first, you know, 30 seconds, 40 seconds in down dog, just allow yourself to be in the pose. I don't need you to do anything different. I'm not going to give you any directions. You know, it's just a sense of waking up your knees, waking up your shoulders, waking up your legs, waking up your spine. Do whatever you need. You know, some people like to bend one knee or the other knee. That's all good for me. Some people like to just have your legs straight. Just take whatever down dog it is that you would like to take. But as many of you might have guessed already, we're gonna turn our shoulders in and out. So you're gonna be here in down dog and you're gonna go into internal and external rotation almost as a way of massaging inside of your shoulder joint. Keep both legs straight. Now what I don't want from you, well, I guess you can do it if you can do it really consciously and mindfully, but what I don't want from you is for you to lift your hands. So keep the hands flat and, and on the ground and just look to get that motion of internal and external rotation inside the shoulder joints. Now it's a fun thing to do if you start to just do one. So when you move your right arm into external rotation, you'll see that 
part of your scapula comes into the rib cage. You might even want to rotate your upper spine a little bit. Uh, and you can just go back and forth. Do one shoulder, do the other shoulder. Feel free to rotate your upper spine. Feel free not to and just to have it be a shoulder exercise. Both of those are perfectly fine. And then from downward dog, walk your feet forward and take Uttanasana. Now, dependent on your flexibility, you can have your knees straight or you can bend your knees. I have absolutely no problem with you bending your knees. But what I do want from you guys is to take your heads down. So instead of having that, that tightness in the back of the neck, let the head go down towards the floor and actually go yes and no a couple times. Nod your head. Just take it, take it up as high as you can. Let me, let me be clear about this. When you go into Uttanasana, you guys can look up for a second if you'd like. When you go into Uttanasana, a lot of people do something like this. And they get this tension all the way up here. What I want from you guys is to take your head down and up. Down and up, down. And you can, you know, rotate back and forth a couple of times. Give your neck a massage. Yeah, that's what I want to see. Just begin to listen to what's happening inside of your neck and ask for whatever it might need. Good, then bring your neck back to neutral and rest. Shift the weight so the weight goes back towards your heels. And keep going back as far as you can possibly go before your toes lift. So you're going to lean back, lean back, and you're going to challenge almost the extremes of what your flexibility and range of motion is right there. And now you're going to do the opposite. Shift your weight all the way forward so you're on the balls of your toes, but not so much as your heels come up. Just want you to get a sense of the difference between the back of the heels or the front of the foot in terms of your uh, hamstring flexibility and you're actually getting into the sciatic nerve a little bit. That looks good. And then come back to neutral and shift your weight all the way to the left. So your hips are going to go to the left not so much that your right foot comes up, but just so much that most of the weight is onto your left foot. Very nice. And then shift your weight all the way to the right. You will feel a completely different kind of uh, neurological tension on you. It's intense, isn't it? I know, I know. So a lot of what that tension is that you guys are feeling um, is yes, dependent on the position of your hips and the flexibility of your hamstrings, but is actually the tension within the sciatic nerve. Okay, come back to neutral. And then go ahead and stand on up. Now here's where it gets tricky for me because I still want to be in the camera. So I'm just going to move this like that a little bit. Yeah, you guys can still see me. Now, after that kind of forward bend, a lot of people like to lift their arms up. So just take your arms up all the way towards the ceiling. Lift the chest, get that openness in the chest. Good. And then if you can, take your arms in and take your arms out. In and out. Now listen. If you begin to have any real pain inside of that shoulder when you do this, you can back off of that. I don't need you to push towards kind of grinding away, but you should be able to have internal and external of rotation of your shoulders while the arms are over your head. Now take them out to the side. One more time, make fists, turn in, turn out, turn in, <laughs> turn out. One more time, turn in and turn out. Good, bring your arms back down. 
Now just take a breath for a second, see how your body feels. Good. Now, I'm going to do the same side as you guys. I, I was deciding if I was going to mirror you and do the opposite or do the same. Um, I'm going to do the same side. So we're going to step our right leg forward. This is my right leg. It might look like the left to you, but it's my right. And left leg back. And we're going to take warrior two. Now, you can have your arms up for the classic warrior two. That's fine. You can have your arms at your sides. That's perfectly fine too. Now the alignment between your front heel, your right heel and your left heel should be somewhere where your right heel is aligned with your left heel or aligned with your arch of your left foot. Okay, I just wanna give you that sense of the pose. So go ahead and change sides. However best you wanna change sides, left foot forward, right foot back, take warrior two. And I'll just keep changing angles so you guys get different angles of the pose. See how much you can bend your thigh. See if you can get the top of your thigh and your, your, your bottom of your thigh where your knee is on the same height. Good, straighten the leg. Now, stay with me guys. Do your right side again. This time, to be honest, put your hands on your hips. It's gonna make it a little bit easier for you. Now, hopefully you all can see me. And I'm taking this angle specifically. You see how my knee is directly over my shin? You see how there's pretty much a straight line from the outer portion of my knee to my hip? Well, that's the proper alignment. That's the perfect alignment. But we're gonna play with this. And what I want you guys to do is you're gonna take your front knee and you're gonna bring it in and then you're gonna take your knee and you're gonna bring it out. Go in with the knee and go out. You'll see when you go in, there's kind of a, you know, your inner groin gets released. You're getting this little bit, it's what we call adduction. But when you go out, you should feel your right glute grip and engage very strongly. You can even give yourself a nice little like booty smack, you know, to see how, how strong it is over there. Good, straighten the leg, it's tiring. Change sides. So bend your left knee, hands on your hips, and you're gonna take that left knee inwards, and you're gonna take that left knee out. In and out. In and out. And you can feel how strong that glute gets when you push that left knee outwards. One more time, in, right, and out. Okay, straighten the left leg. Now I'm gonna give us a little bit of a rest because even I'm out of breath. That right there is the central theme of Davis's law. When we are taking warrior two and we are looking or only creating this type of perfect alignment, we are avoiding these angles of our hip that are common and take place when we walk and in pretty much every single thing we do. The anatomy of the human body is that, and it's more so on women than men, but men have this as well, that there's something called a Q angle, where your hip is here and the legs don't go straight down, they come in at a bit of an angle, like so. So if that's the truth of the human anatomy, and every single time we take warrior one or warrior two, we're, rah, I'm gonna keep this 100% perfect then we're actually slightly going against what our anatomy is. This becomes a big problem. Okay, we're gonna do it one more time. And I'm gonna tilt this down because I want you guys to see what I'm gonna do here. 
Again, we're doing the same thing with, with the warrior two, right leg is forward. But what I want you guys to do is you're actually gonna turn your foot in. Can you see that? Foot normally is right here. Well, you're gonna turn your foot in. Now with the foot turned in, that really allows you to go in. You should feel like the hip bones coming this way, the inner groin is going that way or the inner knee is going that way. And I want you to go back and forth from here. Now you won't be able to go as far out, but you'll be able to go more in. Okay, now take the foot back to neutral and now turn the foot out. See how my foot's turned out? Now you're gonna press out, which is gonna give you two things, a glute strengthening and possibly an adductor stretch right here. And just go in and out a couple of times. You feel how much range of motion that, that gives you, Dana, when you change the foot like that? And with a foot out, again, when you press the knee out, that glute is gonna become rock solid and you might get the stretch in the groin. Now, straighten your leg, put your hands down. Just allow yourself to give yourself a little bit of a hamstring stretch since we're working so hard. And then to come up, bend your knee and push yourself up. It's just a transition point for us. Change sides. So now, again, I know you can't see my upper body, but the most important thing is my lower body. You're gonna turn your foot in, and you're gonna go in and out. In and out. In and out. And then you're gonna turn your foot out. You're gonna go in and out. And again, with the foot turned out, that's gonna really begin to strengthen that glute and you can get a little bit of an adductor stretch. A couple times. In, out. Good. Put the foot straight again, straighten the leg, stretch the hamstring for a second. And then to come up, just bend the knee and push yourself up. So, that's kind of cool, huh? Dana, would we, do, we have any, uh, do we have any important questions about that right there? Let's see. Participants, any, other, any questions about that? We have, you're, I, I'm gonna say you're welcome to unmute yourselves. Um, for the audience who are not in the room with us, we have a few participants who are in the room with Jory and myself. Um, we do have room to admit another person or two if somebody wants to raise your hand. We have, okay, so two things. First, we have uh, one person who's in the room who has her hand up and we have an attendee, no, who does not have their hand up. Okay, so <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and go ahead, um, Rebecca, I'm gonna go ahead and say your name and unmute yourself and ask, please. Hi, thank you very much, thank you. Um, I just want to query on the um, safety and stability of the knee when yes. you're doing that. Yes. Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, if the knee has uh, a tendency to move towards instability in life, mm -hmm. when you are specifically turning the foot out and moving the knee back and forth, they can put a little bit of stress on the, particularly the uh, anterior cruciate ligament, uh, the ACL. So if the knee has a tendency towards instability, you want to be a little bit more mindful that you're not putting too much stress on it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually Good. a phenomenal question. Good. Yes. We had another um, question from an attendee saying curious also about the knee. Thank you, Rebecca. And also to panelists, when you do unmute yourselves, um, your, your faces will come up on the screen when you talk, just so that you know, if you don't want, you'll turn your video off when you unmute yourselves. Yeah. Um, attendees, if you have a question, let us know, put it in the Q&A or raise your hand and we'll call on you. Um, but yes, another person who was in the audience was said they were curious about the knee. Yeah. Um, during yeah. Um, internal, so you may have an answer to that. I'm going to give you one more so I don't have to interrupt you again. Another attendee said during the internal rotation of the knee, my opposite hip became very tense. 
Uh -huh. And he asked, is this a sign of some distortion? Okay, there you, off you go, Jory. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. Um, so first of all, it's not actually um, internal rotation of the knee, uh, it's adduction of the hip. Uh, so it's actually the hip moving that way. Easily confused. The moment you do that, if you are feeling something in your opposite hip, that generally means that you are lacking what we call abduction or abduction of the hip, mm -hmm. okay? Now, we're gonna talk about this for a second. Warrior two works on what's called the frontal plane. So this kind of side to side plane right here. Your, how do I wanna show this? Your back leg here is in what is called abduction or going this way. Now, just to be clear what abduction is, I'm gonna move back. I'm gonna turn on this side. Can you still see me, Dana? Is it okay? Abduction is the ability of the leg to move up and down like so. Okay? A lot of people, due to a weakness of the gluteus medius, the gluteus minimus and the tensor fascia lata, these muscles right here, lack and lose their abduction. So one of the things that you can do, I don't remember the, the person's name who asked the question about feeling it in the opposite hip. One of the things you can do is you can lie on your side, just like I did right there, and you're gonna work on just creating a greater sense of abduction. And after doing that, you can go back into that warrior pose and play with it and see what happens inside your hips. Just Great to take advice. It, Great just answers, to, Joy. Thank you. Dana, I'm going to take it just a tiny step further. Do. Okay. The funny thing is, is that you're asking about the relationship between your knee and your opposite hip. If you study anything about physical therapy and anything about how to rehab a knee injury, one of the absolute first things that classic physical therapy teaches is to strengthen the exact muscles that I just spoke about, gluteus medius, gluteus minimus, and TFL. So for some of you that have that kind of knee problem, have a knee injury, strengthening the outer hips is really important. Now we're going to improvise a little bit and I'm becoming very, very, very clear that my game plan for the rest of today is not going to be happening, but uh, I think we're going to be okay with that. Yeah. So this one is for you knee people. Okay. Everybody one more time. Let's take warrior two on the right side. Now here's the fun thing. I don't care if you take warrior two. I don't care if you take warrior one. I personally like to call warrior one and a half because if I'm here, that's one pose. If I'm here, that's another pose. But the place that I feel the most comfortable is just kind of right there. So whatever kind of knee bent position. Now, hopefully you're all on a mat or not on a carpet. Your right foot is your front foot. Don't let the foot actually move, but start pressing the right foot forward. You'll immediately feel that frontal thigh or quadriceps straight and get, get, get tight and activate. Now, here's where it gets harder. Pull the right heel backwards, pull the right foot backwards. When you do that, you'll probably feel your left groin as well, that's fine. But what I'm asking you to feel is inside of this hamstring here to get the hamstring engagement, now push the right foot forward, pull the right foot back, and just go back and forth a couple times. I'm sweating too, I feel you. Change sides. Left foot forward, push the left foot forward. Don't let it move, but push it forward. Pull the heel backwards. You'll feel the hamstring. You'll feel the underside of your thigh right there. Push forward, pull back, push forward, pull back. Good rest. Now, 
I generally like to tell people that I have two goals with this type of teaching that we're, we're doing today. One is that you get so much of a more understanding of the biomechanics of your body, of what happens when you do this, what happens when you do that. The second goal is that I want to make sure that by the end of today, none of you can walk. It's hard to make jokes over Zoom, forgive me. Okay. I, I once taught a, a, a Awakening the Glue class and one of my friends came and she had like, she was the TRX person, you know, that suspension training. And she had done glute work either that morning or the day before. And I see her the next day and she like, she's like, I am gonna kill you. Yeah, no. The point of that push forward and pull back is because what that actually does is it gets the end points of the muscles, these little micro muscles around the knee, on the front of the knee and the back of the knee to strengthen, to engage. So it's a really nice thing I like to do for, uh, for knee stability, okay? Okay, listen, we like, uh, I don't know, five, six minutes left, something like that. Um, take downward facing dog. Now you'll probably hear me breathing heavy because I'm working too over here. Now everybody, step your right foot into a lunge on the outside of your right hand. Straighten your left knee. Now push the left heel backwards as if you're trying, yeah, just like that. You should get a little bit of a stretch into that left groin. Now walk your right foot closer to your right hand and move your right hand closer to your left hand. I hope that made sense. Now bring your left knee down and point the foot back. So uh, your, your toenails will be on the ground, the top of your foot's on the ground. Now we're gonna play again. Listen, this should feel good. Part of the process of Working with variability is that when you do it, you're not putting yourself into a compromised position. You're doing it to challenge your body in a way that it hasn't been challenged. So what I want from you guys now, your left knee is the one on the ground. Begin to sink your pelvis forward as if it's coming forward towards your right foot. It's not gonna move far and it's not gonna move fast, but what you'll feel is that the upper portion of your kneecap is coming closer to the ground. Almost as if you're beginning to lie your quadricep onto the ground or the very distal furthest part of it from your hip. Now, with your hands on the ground, I want you to roll a little bit to the right so the inner portion of your left knee comes onto the ground. And then you're gonna roll to the left so the outer portion of your left knee comes to the ground. And then you're gonna go the opposite direction. And I really only want you guys to feel what's happening inside of your left hip joint, inside of that groin, those adductors right there, to give them a stretch, allow them to move, and come back to neutral position. right on the center portion of your kneecap almost. Tuck the left toes, come into a full lunge, knee off the ground, press back into downward facing dog pose. Good, and now step your left foot forward and to the outside of your left hand. Keep your right knee off the ground for now. Press your right heel backwards. That's it. And now walk your left hand to the right a little bit so it comes closer, so your hands are closer and walk your left foot closer to your left hand. Bring the right knee down, point the toes backwards. Now again, begin to slowly allow your pelvis to come forward. 
I'm really talking about a millimeter or two millimeters. Your left knee will come a little bit forward and it will feel as if you're beginning to move towards the top portion of your kneecap, that the top portion of your kneecap is touching the ground. Now, roll your hips to the left so you come onto the inner portion of your right knee and then roll your hips to the right so you come onto the outer portion of your left knee. It's a big groin stretch, isn't it? You feel that? So just go back and forth a couple times. You know, a lot of people don't fully understand how to stretch all the way up at that uh, adductor attachment where it attaches on the pubic symphysis. And uh, this is one of those ways. So just back and forth a couple times. And if you feel like, wow, I'm totally opening up my hip in one of these positions that it hasn't been open before, stay here for a second. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay. Tuck the right toes back, lift the knee off the floor. Take downward facing dog pose. And I'm gonna have you guys one more time. We're gonna do one more thing. We're, we're running out of time, but I want you to do one more thing. So step the right foot into a lunge again on the outside of the right hand. Bring the left knee down. Let the toes point backwards and then walk the right foot in towards the right hand a little bit. Or yeah, exactly. Now, can you guys still see me? Let me turn this down. Let me take the, the mirror down a little bit. That's better. Now we've all done this in one way or another before, but you're here, right leg is forward. And I want you to roll until the outside of your right foot comes onto the ground and the inside portion of your right foot is up. And you're just gonna go back and forth. Let it fall out to the side and then bring it up. Inner portion of your foot lifts towards the ceiling and then inner portion of the foot presses down towards the ground. Inner portion of the foot lifts up towards the ceiling. And now if you can hold this here actually, hold this for a second. So if there's any pain in your right knee, you can back off of this. You can dorsiflex the foot or flex the foot so the toes are coming more towards the knee. You see, that's one way to have the foot. That's the other way. That can protect the knee a little bit. But I want you to be here. And for those of you that can, you feel how close you are to the floor now, right? Bring your elbows down. Now just play inside of your right hip. However it is you want to move, allow yourself to move. Just going to rock back and forth a little bit. And come back up, place your hands on the floor. Flatten the right foot on the ground. Tuck the left toes, lift the left knee, push yourself back into down dog. Take a rest here, take a couple breaths. Good, step your left foot to the outside of your left hand and then walk the left foot towards the midline, walk your left hand towards the midline, bring the right knee down, point the right toes backwards. And then one more time, let your left knee fall out to the side and then bring it back up. Let the left knee fall out to the side and bring it back up. Do that two or three more times. Just listen to what it feels like inside of your hip, inside of your body. Once more. And on the next time you roll it out, hold it right there. Again, if there's knee pain, you can avoid it or you can put your foot into a slightly flexed position. And if you can, bring your elbows down onto the ground. Now here's the fun thing. We didn't do this on the other side and I'm just gonna challenge you and play with you guys for a second. 
with your elbows down on the ground, you'll have to look up. You're gonna try to plant your foot down onto the ground and then you're gonna let it fall out to the side. Plant it down to the ground, let it fall out to the side. One more time. Plant it down, let it fall out to the side. That becomes a lot more difficult when the elbow's down as opposed to with your arms straight. Okay, straighten your arms, plant the foot down, tuck the right toes, lift the right knee, push back into downward facing dog pose, and then take child's pose. At the risk of being a killjoy because yep. I'm. Nope, been it, it's myself. time, you're right. Six now, so I have to kind yes. of give you a little warning. <laughs> yep. I was like, oh, I wouldn't do the stretches, but I'm having to pay attention to the time. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, awesome. So. Thank you, Georgina, for popping in. Oh, yeah. my goodness. I have so many questions for you now, Jory. <laughs> I don't know what to do. <laughs> I think. Coffee break. Uh, coffee break. <laughs> coffee break room. So, um, thank you so much, Jory. I just, I feel yeah. like, oh, my goodness, we could go for a lot longer, huh? Just yeah. looking at the chat here, there are several other interesting, wonderful comments. It looks like people have really appreciated it. Um, audience, before you leave, before I um, before I let Jory have a few last words here, even though we could go for another hour, um, <laughs> I have a couple of things to tell you. Uh, those of you who are watching, check in your chat. You can go to the coffee break room, find some other people who were here and do a little bit more of this. You can go to Jory's website and you can do online courses with him, which I did, but it was way more fun in person. <laughs> um, and also remember, you might want to review the material that Jory just gave you, what you just experienced. And from other also, um, other, uh, sorry, other presentations here, other sessions here at the Embodiment Conference. So I strongly recommend, as I said earlier, that you go ahead and buy it, even maybe just the smallest package. There are a few different ways to, um, to get access to all of the amazing information that's being given out here for free for 48 hours. But it's your purchase that allows us to put this damn thing on, uh, this thing on because <laughs> it's been a heck of a lot of work. And we're doing, we're, we're kind of, we're, we're making this work and we couldn't do it without you all who are here. So we appreciate your support. Um, and please continue to spread this embodiment conference to those of you who might benefit from it as well. Uh, remember, we have a Facebook page you all can join, um, Facebook group you all can join, and keep the movement movement going. And I'm going to turn it. Did I get everything, Georgina? I'm kind of still in my hip joint. I'm like, oh, wait. <laughs> well, okay. You got it all, Denny. You got it all. <laughs> the link. I am so excited. <laughs> We've got everything for everybody. So, um, those of you who joined, thank you so much for joining. We look forward to seeing you in another session. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Jory because I think we've got at least one, if not two more minutes to gain his wisdom and suck it out of you. What else do you have there, Jory? Yeah, so um, I mean, first of all, it's been my pleasure. I really appreciate your guys' questions. I appreciate uh, the, the several of you that are in the you know windows here and I got to watch you. So thank you, Amber, Rebecca, Ashley, Dana, you guys all rock. Um, you know, just remember with your practice, um, we are not, trying to create alignment. We are not mm. trying to create misalignment. Our goal and our job with our practice is to first and foremost develop sensitivity. Mm -hmm. You know, our job is to be able to listen to what our body is telling us and follow that. The truth is, is that every single person on this, oh, I got a good question. Uh, every single person, <laughs> Sorry, Margaret. <laughs> um, every single person on this planet has an innate body intelligence. And any teacher in the world can tell you what to do and can give you directions and guide you in this way or that way. But the true teacher that you have is already speaking to you. Uh, and part of the practice of the yogic path and of meditation, and I think of just simply being a human being, is to learn how to listen to that voice better listen to what it's saying and follow that because uh, chances are it's gonna lead you in the right direction. Awesome, thank you so much, Dory. Thank you, it was wonderful to work with you. Mm -hmm.